So with our fondness of checking out local and somewhat local breweries, we're always kind of on the lookout for games that can kind of have that drinking theme, could possibly be played there, kind of have an element that kind of lends itself to that. So, Drinking Quest, Belch of the Wild, piqued my interest because it seemed to fit that. So, let me show you how it plays, and I'll let you know if it did fit that theme and goal. Also, my other thoughts on it after this. All right, we are set up for Drinking Quest, Belch of the Wild. I am only showing you one person's area. The other people will have an area similar. I'm also only showing you quests set out of one through four. There are two bonus quests. Alcoholic Anime is played before one, and House of the Flagon is played after four. We're going to set those aside for now. So to set it up, you are going to have the store out in the display for everyone to see. You have the three dice, a D4, a D6, and a D8. You have your quests lined up, room for a discard pile, I have them on top, and one to four. Each person is going to have a character sheet, a hero, an annoying sidekick, and that hero has a signature drink. I didn't fill out my sheet, but when you have the sheet, you're going to put your player name, your hero name is Codex Carl, your annoying sidekick is Mixed Beast, your max hit points is shown here in the heart, your current hit points, you'll be taking damage throughout the game, you'll put those there, your attack currently is a D4 plus 1 because you're starting with a satchel of lemons, your defense value is there and it's a 0, your saving throws are listed here, and you'll check down here to see if it is... Adjust it all by your annoying sidekick. So, for instance, Codex Carl has an 11 self-worth, but the annoying sidekick does decrease that by 1, so it's only a 10. A 15 smarts goes down to a 13. A 6 tolerance goes down to a 4. And a sexual prowess goes from a 9 to a 6. The Mixed Beast also has it where you have plus 1 to all initiative rolls. A garnish ability of you can bank your signature drinks between quests if unused, so you get one additional use with the annoying upgrade. So here is that signature drink. So for him, it's a rules lawyer root bear once per quest, so basically once per each deck. Carl can drink this root bear to discover a new rule. You roll a d4 and then do what it says. So your beginning weapon you'll put down here in weapons, armor, and items. You don't have any chugs, you don't have any XP or any coins to start. So how a turn works is the first thing you can do on your turn is you can visit the market to buy anything. You also can sell stuff at half the price, rounded round uh, down, including your starting weapon. So as I said, I start with a satchel of lemons. That is 50, so I can sell it back to them for 25. If I choose not to visit the market, I will then... Or even if I do visit the market, I will choose to draw the top card of the current quest, flip it over, read it, and resolve it. So this is a Calamity Cocktail. Mix in a drink, you are surprised to see it's taken on a life of its own. It was a bad idea to steal ingredients from the forbidden bar fridge. This is the worst drink you've ever made. So we are now going to be starting combat. How combat works is it starts with an initiative roll. So you... And a person to your left, or if you're only playing two players like we do, the person across from you, you each are going to roll a d6. And normally, this is a 5, but because of my annoying sidekick, it's a plus 1. So I have a 6. They will roll, and we will compare values. Ties go to the active hero, not to the card. So at 6, I am guaranteed to go first. I then am going to roll my attack. My attack is a d4 plus 1. So I'll roll that. I rolled a 4. Plus 1 is 5. We check to see if it has any defense. It does not. I do 5 damage to it, which is enough to kill it because it only has a defense of 4. I would then get 55 gold and 1 experience that I would put down here in coins and experience. Had I not defeated him, he would then attack me back. Again, my opponent rolls the d6. I take that. I check my defense. If I take damage, I will lower my max hit points to what my current hit points is. So I start off with 6, so in this instance, it would be 4. So had I not defeated him, we'd go back and forth until he was defeated, or if I was defeated. If I get lowered to 0 health or less, I am defeated. I then have to chug whatever drink I am currently drinking, unless I've previously chugged this quest, in which case I take 
three sips, and then I'll mark how many chugs I did down below. So, after I resolve my card, then the next player will go. And then it'll come back to me. So if I flip over the next card, we have Secret Recipe. You may camp and decide to try out Mom's recipe for deep fried bear pines. Roll a saving throw for smarts. So when you roll a saving throw, you're going to grab all three dice and roll them. You're going to add up their values and compare it to what your saving throw is. So this is smarts. I start it with a 15, a minus 2 for that, so I have a 13. We have 4, 8, 11. You have to meet the saving throw or be below it, so I needed to roll a 13 or less, with which I did. So I will then do the success. If I did not succeed, I would instead do the failure. So in this instance, you gain a delicious deep-fried bellow ale, which will restore you to maximum hit points. Also gain an experience point from being a master chef, which I put down in my experience points. As you complete these, they'll go to the discard pile, and then you'll keep going back and forth. In a two-player game, you go until each person has done four cards. In, the, in a three- and four-player, you're going to go until the deck is empty. There are 12 cards in each quest. After you complete one quest, you are then going to heal back up to your maximum hit points and then have an opportunity to visit the shop yet again. Once everyone is ready to move on to the next quest, you bring forth the next quest deck and repeat that again, four cards each in a two-player game, repeating all of that until you get to the end of quest four. At that point, whoever has the most experience points is the winner. That is the basics of playing Drinking Quetch, Belch of the Wild. A lot of the smaller mechanics kind of come into what items and weapons you have, what how these cards interact, and what cards you draw from the decks. All right, so let's get on to my two cents. All right, so that is how you play Drinking Quest, Belch of the Wild. So there are... Quite a few drinking quest games out there. This is the first that we have played. Um, I will say, kind of spoiler alert, we are thinking about looking at trying to get the other ones because we did have a lot of fun with this one. But let's get into my two cents. So first off is components. So the cards have fun and some people and sometimes might, might find some kind of crude names. So here's just a few. I don't want to give too much away because that is one of the fun elements of it. So you have like your rum raccoon. You have chickens that you're fighting, but then you also have sexy Cthulhu. So there are some here that have kind of some innuendos, possibly a swear word. So it does have that kind of adult-ish theme, but nothing like too graphic or explicit. So you don't necessarily have to go full on, you know, 18 and up in regards to the, the names and such of the cards. The cards themselves are pretty decent. There is a linen finish. I would say to me personally, they, they feel a little thin, but we really had no issue with it. Um, but like I said, linen finish, so they did feel good in the hand. We enjoyed the names. We enjoyed the artwork. Um, some may find the text a little hard to read. It is a little small, not too bad, and I'll, we never really had much issue with it. But if text size is something that you are concerned about, this is roughly the text size. And then the um, market board does seem to be maybe a little busy. And again, a lot of words kind of smaller. So some people may have issues with that. But again, we didn't. And I mean, they can easily just pick it up and look at it. It doesn't have to stay there during their turn. When they're doing it, they can grab it and look at it. The dice, we really enjoyed the dice. They are nice, sparkly, really cool looking. I mean, they have tons of sparkleness to them. Can't really get that well on the camera, but you saw it on the how to play. Also, this Mead Meeple, that is just really cool looking and enjoyable. And even if we don't keep it in the game, we're going to keep it nearby to just be a cool decoration. So yeah, component quality, we really enjoyed. The box hold, held everything. The box was a good, nice, decent size. Um, you got a ton of character sheets, and they are double-sided, so you get plenty of use out of that. The rule book itself also crystal clear. Everything was explained quickly, easily. 
No issues, no qualms, no questions. All right, the experience at two players. So each quest has 12 cards. As I said, in a two-player game, you each only play four, so you're playing eight out of 12. So I enjoy that because then you're not going to see every card every game. So you aren't going to get maybe that repetitive feel you may get if you're going to go through every all 12 cards every game. When you only are going through eight of the 12, then new ones might pop up from here or there. Also for us then, it is a bit quicker because if you have to go through all 12 cards in a three or four player game, you're going through 48 cards. In a two player game, you're only going through 32. And what's nice with that is, as I said, there's a side quest that you can put at the beginning and end. So in a two player game, you can, and it's not really gonna extend the gameplay beyond what it says on the box, because at that point now, you are playing through 48 cards as you would in a three or four player game. So in a two player game, it seems a little bit easier that you might be able to throw those extra quests in there without really prolonging that much from what the game was intended. And then with this one being, you know, small, compact, especially at two players, I can easily see this one being one that we would grab, as I said, going to the brewery. Because then, you know, when you chug, when you die, well, then just make sure you just have a bunch of tasters. That way you're not chugging a full drink. You're just chugging a little, like, you know, six, eight ounce string, so it's not going to be as bad, and it's not going to get you as plastered, although they do make sure to mention in the book, if you are going to be doing the chugging, and especially alcoholic beverages, make sure everyone knows how they're going to get home, and make sure you do drink it responsibly, because a board game is no reason to get drunk and sloshed and get a DUI or anything like that, so make sure you do play this responsibly. But as I said, if you play at a brewery, just have a bunch of little tasters, that way you're not chugging Full drinks, or when you do take your sips, you are just doing a little sips out of the little tasters. So yeah, definitely, as I said, I can see this being a really good brewery game that you can all just sit around as you have your beers and playing with it. So on to the negatives. So for the negatives, I will say that this is, and you're going to have to realize this, this is kind of a lighter game that has quite a bit of luck of the draw to it. The first game that Brian and I played... I played a combat heavy dwarf because I was like playing dwarfs. She picked the one that had high saving throws. So I was kind of built for combat. She was built for more of the events. And of course, as luck would have it, I got a lot of events that I kept failing with saving throws and she kept getting combats that she was able to win, but was tight and kept pushing her near death because she was built to do more of the events and the saving throws. So there will be some of those games where you may, your card draws aren't going to be suited to the character you chose but as you're doing that maybe you realize all right well maybe that i'll kind of beef up the stuff that i don't do well by getting other stuff on the board so like her because she was doing so many combats she ended up making sure she got to her staff of the tequila tamer quicker which started doing a d8 damage so she was able to do more of that damage as she was doing more and more combats so it is kind of about Maybe figuring out how to balance your character as you're going, that if you are starting with someone who's saving throw heavy, well, then you know, all right, maybe I need to boost up my combat just in case that starts happening. So you can mitigate that, but do know there is that luck of the draw element there to where you might be gaining a bunch of events. So then you're just going to be doing saving throws constantly. And then the other negative, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it at an, as a negative per se, but I would more a suggestion, I would grab at least one to two more sets of dice. That way you don't have to keep sharing the same dice And because when you do the initiative, one person would roll, then you have to pass it over to the other. And if this is a game where you're going to be kind of chugging drinks and drinking and kind of having that fun element, you don't want to necessarily have to remind, rely too much on remembering things. So if you each have your own D6, you both roll it, and then you can just compare it. So I would suggest grabbing a second set of die. That way you can have one each in a two-player game, or even a three, as long as you have two, you can pass it to whoever is doing the combats and such. But that's really all for negatives for us. We really didn't have too many issues with this game. So let's go ahead and get into the theme of the game. The cards do a good job of providing story. Like, why is this card happening? Like, for example, to get back to the chickens. Just to see what happens, you swing your weapon at a chicken. It is hilariously inconvenienced. You continue whacking away until all of its chicken buddies swarm you with a beaky fury. These chickens give no clucks. So 
you could I can completely see some kind of haphazard group of adventurers who are just out to just do goofy random things, stumbling into town and one being like, haha, I'm gonna kick the chicken or swing my sword at the chicken, and then just all types of madness and craziness ensue. So that the cards do a good job of explaining why that card's happening. You're not flipping over a card it's just like you're attacked by a chicken. I have a why is the chicken attacking me? Well here, because you attacked it first. So it does have that good element. And the fact that each quest has a theme, so you have all these themed cards, and you're not going to just have something weird and random happen out of the blue. It's like, you know, the second one is you inherit a sausage factory. So that's all kind of sausage related. So it is nice that they have the themed decks so you can stay, like, inside the game and picture what's going on there. Also, with this kind of being like a drinking RPG type element, as I showed, the... Player sheet really kind of evokes that. You have your saving throws, your hit points, your attack. You have your whole little area down here. So that is what we think of the theme. Finally, we're going to get to the smoothness. How smooth does it play? It is easy and fast to learn, understand, and play. The, like the one main thing that might slow it down is if someone can't figure out what they want to buy at the market. That would be the slowest thing that otherwise it's literally... Flip over a card, read it if it's a combat, roll back and forth if it's a saving throw roll, compare your number, and your turn is done. So quick, smooth, fast. And then the only other things that do kind of slow it down or might kind of hinder that is as you're attacking the monster. So let's use the chickens, for example. They have a three health. Well, like with Bry, when she played the first character, it was only like a 1d4, 1d4 plus 1 damage. So if you're rolling low, and then some of the monsters later do kind of get a little bit higher up, having to try and remember the damage on those monsters. One option you could do is if there is a die, because you probably won't be using all three dice, you could put that on the monster and kind of manipulate the die to how many hit points it's taken or how many it has left would be one of the options, but that could that's one of the only things that kind of slow down the smoothness. And there is a decent amount of... Um, erasing and then rewriting because when you defeat a monster you get gold when you get the experience you'd be erase you possibly erasing that unless you do little hash mark tally mark things your hit points you're going to be doing that at the end of every quest you heal up to your max hit points so you're erasing there so there is a bit of erasing i know that is one thing that bry was not a fan of was the amount of erasing on the game but that was i believe her only gripe with it except again the luck of the draw which i've already covered but overall, I am going to give this a rating of four rings out of five. It is one that we really did enjoy. It is one that will be going into our go bag, travel bag, for when we do go out to the breweries and such, because we always have writing utensils on us. I always have dice on me. There's dice in the box, so we will be good to go. So again, Drinking Quest, Belch of the Wild. And if I could go ahead and get you to like, subscribe, comment, and share, and ring the bell for this channel, I would be appreciated, and I will chug one for you if you are able to do that for me. Until next time, get chugging.